Now we're going to chapter 10. We are just going to start studying about you know, DNA, genetic material. What are the characteristics of the inheriting material? It has to contain some complex information that has to be passed down the line. And it has to replicate faithfully because you don't want a lot of changes happening between one generation and the next, right? If you're dealing about, talking about DNA expression of proteins, if something works, you want to keep it working. And also the genetic material, whatever it is, it has to encode for the trait that is, has its needs information, right? It has to encode for the phenotype. So these are the basic characteristics of what the genetic material is. So this chapter is just going to tell you the story of DNA. How was it that the scientists figured out that DNA was the genetic material? So starting in 1869, this um, Johann Mischer was studying some chemistry of pus, not pus in boots, pus out of uh, infections, lots of white blood cells, big white blood cells with huge nuclei. So he was looking at that and he figured out that these nuclei had something that was slightly acidic, right? It was different from proteins. So he called that it was a nuclein or a nucleic acid. Yeah, so in the nucleus, it has to be some kind of nuclei stuff. So 1887, we knew that the basis of, for heredity was inside the nucleus. Now, if you look at the nucleus, you'll see a lot of DNA, yes, but you also see a lot of protein. Remember, DNA is complex with proteins, with the histones. So, yes, it's in the nucleus, but is it the protein or is it the DNA? Is it nucleic acid or is it protein that is encoding for all these genetic characteristics? Now, around the 1800s, this other scientist here, Cosell, determined that the DNA had the four bases, the A, C, T, and G. So these are all little steps that are coming together to figure out how really DNA was found to, have, to be the genetic material. So in 69, you don't have to really know this table, just a little idea of the timeline that these things were uh, happening. In 1910, Phoebus Levine at the Rockefeller Institute, he figured out that the nucleotide was composed of these three different molecules. It was composed of the sugar and the base and the phosphate. And he also suggested that DNA had some type of repetitive sequence. He thought it would be, you know, ACTG, ACTG, ACTG. So he figured out something important about DNA. So then a little bit later, 1948, Shargaff came along and he figured out that the ratios for A to T's are always the same and then the ratios for C's to G's were always the same. So he figured out there's something to do with A to T's, A's and T's and C's and G's. They always are in the same proportion. So that's called the Shargaff's rule. Now, how do you figure out what the nucleotide is made of? You have a little house here, is the sugar. You have a garage, which is your base. And you have a swimming pool, which is a phosphate pool. Okay, phosphate. House with a garage and a pool. That's what makes your nucleotide. So now coming down the line, 1928, Griffith was demonstrating the transforming principle. And then 44, you have McCarty. Now we're going to get to that in a minute. Those are important experiments. Remember when I said the gene is not a hermit? The genes need other genes to work. So scientists are not hermits either. They often need work of other scientists for there's something significant to come out of it. Now, coming back on how, how the path was uh, developed down the line here. The question is, what is it carrying the genetic material? Is it DNA or is it protein? Well, at that time, it was thought that proteins were carrying the genetic material because you have a lot more proteins than you have bases. DNA, you have ACTG. And then proteins, you have at least 20 of them that you can mess around with. Since we know that an organism is so complex, you probably need very complex stuff to code for its genetic material. So protein was the one that was ahead of the line. Now, when you also measure the amount of protein that you have in cells, you know that usually it's about 50% of the dry weight of the cell. This is all protein weight. And if you measure the amount of DNA, it's just a little fraction of that. So there comes this guy, Griffith, 1920. He was working with two types of bacteria that would cause pneumonia, if I remember right. Yes, yeah, Streptococcus. He had this rough strain of bacteria 
that he knew he wasn't going to do anything to these mice that he was in infecting, you know, bacterial infection. Inject these poor mice with this rough strain, and the mice survive. And then he decided that he wanted to trace test a virulent strain, which was the S strain. So he comes over there, he gets this S sticks in the mouse, the mouse dies. Okay, so he comes back and say, what happens if I kill the S? So he goes and he kills the S, put in the mouse, the mouse leaves. Okay, okay, so he killed the bacteria. Now he said, okay, now what happens if I put a dead S with a live R? What's going to happen to the mouse? He was assuming that the mouse is going to live, but that didn't happen. The mouse died. And then when he examined the bacteria that were growing in the mouse, he found live S. So he put in dead S, he got the live S out of it for smooth. Okay. Why that was happening, he didn't really know, but he knew there was some form of exchange of information between this dead bacteria and the live one that was non-virulent. There was something happening there. Then later on, 1944, there came McCarthy and his colleagues. He figured out that DNA was what was doing the trick because he got these cells, got hit killed as strain cells, he got you know, the bacteria cells, and he started to extract things out of this mixture. He grinded it up and he said, okay, I'm going to take out all the lipids and all the carbohydrates out of this mixture that he ground up. He was left with this other mixture here, no lipids, no carbohydrates, because they knew lipids and carbohydrates are not doing anything to the genetic material, so he could eliminate that. So now he said, in this flask here, I will degrade all the protein. He adds proteinases here, okay, proteinases, degrade all the protein. So he, this has no protein, it has DNA and RNA, that's it. So when he add live rough cells, with the dead, heat killed smooth cells, dead S here, he came up with the transformation again and he came up with uh, the life S showing up here. So he said, okay, it has to do, genetic information has to do something with DNA or RNA, one of the two. So then he came up in the second tube and he said, I'm going to use ribonuclease and I'm going to degrade all the RNA. Actually, he didn't really have to use ribonuclease for that, he could just touch that with the, with the non-gloved fingers, which I think in 1944, that's probably what he was working with. If you have a lot of the RNAs in your fingers, you try to work with RNA and everything dies out. So that was, you know, touch this finger here, all the RNA is degraded. So he knew he had here protein and he had DNA. So now he put in uh, the live R cells and he comes up with live S again. He said, okay, something's happening here. I know it's not the protein because it does degrade the protein here. So protein is not doing the trick because he had protein there and protein didn't do the trick here. So he eliminated protein and now he eliminated RNA as well. So he's only left with DNA. So he said, okay, to prove the point, he came up to his other side here and he degraded only the DNA. He used the oxyribonuclease right, to chop up only the DNA and leave everything else. Don't ask me how he kept the RNA in there. So what happened is that he added the live R and he gets no live S coming out of there. All the dead, the S was still dead. There was no transformation happening. So based on this, he figured out the DNA must be the genetic material. Okay, so there, 1944, 1952, that's the most uh, important experiment that you are, always hear about, Hershey and Chase experiment. I really think it's important because, because um, I like chocolate and I remember you know, Hershey chocolate, but I would definitely not want Hershey chocolate with a bacteriophage in it. Mm. So Hershey and Chase, what did they do? They came up with a very clever idea. They said, okay, we have to prove that DNA is the genetic material. How are we going to do that? They said, well, we can use viruses. What is it in the virus? There is only a coat for protein and there is genetic material. It can be DNA or RNA. If you're working with uh, bacteriophages, you know, this spaceship looking type of virus, you know that your genetic material is DNA. So this bacteriophage has only a protein coat and DNA. That's it, that's the virus. So he said, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm going to trace where the material is coming from by using uh, radioactive probes. What he did is that he decided to use 
radioactive sulfur, sulfur-35, to probe all his protein. So he gets this bacterial culture. Okay, these are bacteriophages. They have to grow in bacteria. They cannot replicate any other way. These are viruses, right? And in this soup, you know, he also put this uh, spaceship-looking bacteriophage that's going to infect the bacteria. In this soup here, he puts a lot of hot S, hot sulfur in there. So what this is going to do when the cell is growing is using the uh, sulfur that is radioactive, and all the protein that it has sulfur is getting some of that radioactivity, right? So all protein here is going to be labeled. Now, he said, okay, I've got to figure out how to label the nucleic acid. He said, okay, nucleic acid has phosphorus, so he's going to use P32 for labeling nucleic acid. So in another bath here, he had the same idea, same principle. Instead of putting S35, he puts P32. Now the bacteria here is, uh, you know, dividing, and the virus is happily replicating and budding out of it. And now all of the DNA of this little virus here is coated with radioactivity, with P32. So now he says, how is it? He's going to figure out which one is which, what's going to happen here. When he infected bacteria that were not labeled, just plain bacteria, and he looked at what came out of it, he found out that the ones that he had labeled with the S35, with the sulfur, it did not go into the cell. It was only present in the coat, in the coat of the virus. He collected his culture and he separated the viruses from the bacteria. He only found radioactivity on the coat of the old virus, not in the new virus. Virus that come up from a new soup is just a normal virus without any radioactivity. So then he looked at the ones in which, let me go to the next page here, yeah. Okay, so here's the soup again, okay, he has the bacteriophage, he put in the soup, he grows t uh, S35, he chops it up and spins it down. When he looks at the supernatant of this, he finds all radioactive protein, and the new bacteriophage that was coming out had no radio radioactivity, okay? New bacteria coming out, just normal. Now, when he used the one that he used, the P32, okay, he did the same thing, grew in that hot broth, ground it up, spin it down. When he looked at the coat of the virus, of the protein, there was no radioactivity there. And then when he looked at the new virus, he found P32, okay, which means the bacteria that was growing here was passing some information to the new virus that's going to come out of there that is going to have radioactivity. So what is being transmitted from the parent bacteria to the daughter bacteria, it has to do with P32, it must be DNA, because this virus only has protein or DNA. If it's not the protein, it must be the DNA. So this is how they figured out the DNA was it. We know that DNA is the universal genetic code and is probably does it happen only with microbes? No, of course not. It happens with everything else. I even think it happens with extraterrestrials. What happened here, another convincing evidence that DNA was a genetic material, it could be seen just by looking at haploids or regular somatic cells okay, of, uh, of uh, organisms. You could say if you look at a human, if you have a haploid, you have half of the amount of DNA than if you have a diploid. And you look at the chicken, oh, the same thing, half as a diploid. And then you look at the trout, the fish trout, oh, half of the amount as a somatic cell. So there must be something to do with these gametes if they only have half of the amount of DNA. And then you know you have another gamete that has to fuse with this. And the amount of protein is the same. If you have here a gamete, and you look at the amount of protein, and then you look here at a somatic cell, the amount of protein is the same from here and there. And then only the DNA amount would be, you know, these two would be double the DNA amount, and this would be half of the DNA amount. So that was another very strong evidence that DNA was a genetic material. Okay, protein is the same, DNA is different, so what is carrying the genetic material? Okay. Another convincing evidence here that DNA was the genetic material is that, as I mentioned in the lab, it is absorbed at a wavelength of 260, 260 nanometers. And you know that proteins were absorbed at a different wavelength, like 280. 
if you shine light of 260 and destroy the DNA, so you know you're causing genetic changes, but at the same time, you know, you're not really destroying the protein, right? You can detect the DNA at that particular wavelength. Just another evidence that DNA was a genetic material. Oh, the green fluorescent protein monkeys. Those are experiments done with the gene expression. Is gene the genetic material, or is it encoding an universal code? So if you have a protein that expresses you know, glow in the dark gene, green, and you put it in a chromosome of the monkey, and you know the monkey is going to express the protein, you're saying, am I going to see it or not? So somebody decided to make a green monkey that grows in the dark. Yes, and it is a genetically, you know, universal code because it, this GFP protein comes from a fluorescent uh, bacteria. You put the gene of the bacteria in the monkey and it's pressed with no problem. And other than being green, those are pretty normal monkeys. No, no, the GFP is the protein itself. It works right. It's just pressed everywhere in this poor monkey. There was another experiment that was also proving that either DNA or RNA was the original material. Okay, so came this guy, uh, Singer, and um, Frank O'Conrad, 1956. They wanted to know what happens to, in case of virus that does not have DNA. Okay, you know, a lot of viruses will carry RNA as a genetic material, right, not DNA. So he said, well, how can the genetic information be passed down if you have RNA and not DNA? So he figured out, oh, let me figure out the thing with the protein and the nucleic acid story. So he got this virus that has a genetic code as RNA, tobacco mosaic virus. And he took out the protein from the RNA. He stripped this RNA from two different types of uh, virus, A and B. And then he mixed up protein B, okay, coming from this virus, protein B with RNA A and then protein A with RNA B, he just swapped them. I said, okay, now I want to see if the protein is going to encode for the new virus or if the RNA is going to encode for the new virus. After he infected the plant, the tobacco plant, and he came up with new virus, he saw that everyone that had this type of RNA came up now with the A type of protein, like just the way it was before, and then the other one was the same thing. So he got rid of the different proteins there. He also proved that RNA was a genetic material for the tobacco mosaic virus. Okay. After that, we're going to look at the primary structures of DNA, and you know that are uh, deoxyribonucleotides, and also secondary structures of DNA. So let me see here. Yeah, I think we can stop here.